everyone. I, uh, I have to say, Ian's talk has, has messed up my, <laughs> what we say in Kenya, roho, is your heart. Uh, it's really troubling stuff that he talked about. Um, I run a Kenyan organization that really seeks to change the hearts and minds of every single person in the country. Um, Wildlife Direct was founded in 2004, and in 2013, we launched a campaign to address and to really, really transform the way things are, are dealt with, not just in Kenya, not just in Africa, but the world. We really take it for granted that these magnificent animals, elephants, uh, will always be there. This is Amboseli National Park. A couple of hours from Nairobi, you could be in the midst of a herd of elephants. Every single elephant in this population is known by name. They've been studied for the longest of any elephants in the world, over 42 years by the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, Cynthia Moss, and three Maasai women, so local people who bring their traditional knowledge to tell the stories of these incredible animals. The work that's been done in Kenya has revealed some incredible and outstanding, surprising things about elephants. Their intelligence, they have a brain six times the size of a human brain. It's just as complex. They are emotional, they are touchy-feely creatures, they live in families. If we were elephants here in Cape Town and another herd was standing on Robben Island, they would be able to hear us they'd know who's speaking, and they'd know what we're saying. They're extraordinary. We know all of this through science and research, but it's never been translated into a love affair with elephants by Africans themselves. In fact, most Africans think that elephants are dangerous, scary creatures that kill your children, trample your crops, and destroy your, your future livelihoods. I started studying elephants uh, from a very young age. Uh, because I fell in love with this, this, the humanness of them. This is Kamkwat, one of those Amboseli elephants. She's a matriarch, 44 years old, one of the most famous elephants in the world. Her family is named after the Q letter of the alphabet, so every single individual in the family's name begins with Q. So that's Quintilla behind her, Q-tip, her grandson, Quay behind them. Quay is another female with her little baby, Kwanzaa. These elephants have been followed since Kumquat herself was only seven years old. She's an incredible matriarch, started off as an orphan, rose through the social ranks of elephant hierarchy, and led a family of 39 individuals all across that part of southern Kenya, into Tanzania, around Mount Kilimanjaro, thousands of kilometers per year, avoiding danger, finding food, finding water during droughts. Well, we, I adore elephants. I think they're incredibly precious, but there are people in this world, not just in China, all over the world, who value elephants for their tusks. Tusks are the incisors. And elephants are the only animal in the world that produce tusks, and that's part of the reason why they're so valuable. And right now, we're facing a crisis because ivory is considered incredibly valuable, especially in China, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, countries in the Far East. And ivory has turned into what I would say are ridiculous trinkets carvings of, of their gods, little sculptures, tiny little elephants, cups, all kinds of silly things. And because of the demand for ivory in China, and that's a whole other conversation, because the demand has risen and the price of ivory has grown by 300% in just three years, elephants are being slaughtered across the continent at unprecedented rates. Gunmen shoot 35,000 elephants every year. 35,000 thinking, feeling, emotional creatures. What's left behind are the shattered families of the few individuals that survive, which become very dangerous individual animals. Well, Kamkwat is the inspiration for the campaign that I'm running, because in October 2012, she was gunned down. Kamkwat and her entire family, that's her daughter, Quay, Quintilla was killed, all of them were killed. 
The only survivor was Kwanzaa. Two weeks old, didn't have tusks, wasn't worth wasting a bullet on her. Kwanzaa was rescued four days later when she was found standing beside the body of her dead aunt. And she's a traumatized three-year-old now. But it's not just Ambaseli, this is Samburu, Bonsai, another matriarch. Laruka, a big bull from Masai Mara, where we have one of the most severe killing fields in Africa right now. And of course, Satao. Satao was probably the biggest elephant in Africa when he was shot by a poison arrow on the 30th of May last year. So we are almost at the anniversary of Satao's death. His death shows that elephants are not just statistics. 35,000, sounds like a lot, nobody knows what it really means. But Satao, the biggest elephant in the world, taken out by a poison arrow inside one of the best protected national parks in Kenya. It shocked the world, it shocked the Kenyan authorities. In fact, initially the government said this elephant didn't, never existed, Paula must have made it up. The story that we keep being told and the narrative that comes out of places like Kenya is that the poaching is happening because people are poor, they're desperate, they're barefoot, they need to send their kids to school. Uh, it's not a story that I buy. It's not true. Poachers are just workers for major criminal cartels. We know this from the seizure information that's coming out of the CITES Secretariat and all of the people who are monitoring ivory seizures around the world. The increase in the rate of trafficking of ivory out of Africa is rising exponentially. And it's not just more ivory, it's the volumes. We're now seeing container loads, four tons, five tons of ivory moving in one go. This is not something that can be done by a poor barefoot guy in the bush. This is being done by major criminal cartels. We're talking about an international problem on the scale of the narcotics trade. So what does it mean? What, what does this what does it actually mean for us? In Kenya, our largest banknote carries a herd of elephants, and we've turned it into a herd of dead elephants. Our economy is at stake, but it's not just our economy. This business can only happen because of corruption. And the only way that we can address some of these major problems and the reasons why this is happening is if we win the hearts and minds, not just of Kenyans, but of our political leadership, because addressing it is going to be a very difficult challenge. We have to ask the questions. Is the problem in Africa? Is it because of the poaching in Africa? Or is it the target, should the target really be China, where most of the ivory is going? These are really tough questions. As a Kenyan organization, we can go straight to the heart of our government and shake our fists and march on the streets, which many international organizations can't get away with. Our campaign is called Hands Off Our Elephants. I've been told that when it's translated into Chinese, it's a very rude statement. And fair enough, I think it's time to stop being polite. We can't just go around tiptoeing around people's feelings. We're losing part of our African heritage. It's like a war is being waged against Africa. Imagine if the Chinese went to England and said, you know those big rocks out that place called Stonehenge? They'd make really nice buildings. Let's chip away at them. You know, the British people would see that as a, a war, an attack on the, the pride of British people. If they did that here in Cape Town and went off to Table Mountain and said, let's just take all that beautiful rocks and, and make something else out of it, it just would not be socially acceptable, politically acceptable. Why is it that our leaders are, are not taking the necessary actions to stop the plunder of the world's largest mammal, one of the most magnificent species on this planet. So this is what we're doing at Wildlife Direct. The first thing is mobilizing the public, what we call winning hearts and minds. Millions of Kenyans have joined this campaign. The thousands of people join us on the street when we walk. The second thing is to stop the supply of ivory. Now, a lot of organizations are on the ground, uh, you know, trying to protect elephants from the poison arrows, from the guns. We're going after the traffickers. This fellow, Faisal Muhammad Ali, is probably one of the biggest ivory kingpins in East Africa. We had him arrested last year after he'd been a fugitive for seven months. I had to 
camp out in the Inspector General's office for eight hours to have an audience with him to insist that the Kenya government bring Interpol in to help catch this man who was in hiding in Tanzania at the time. These people are connected, powerful, wealthy, they buy favors, they, they have police protection. So it wasn't easy, but he is behind bars today and his trial begins in June. And finally, of course, we have to extinguish demand, something that Adam spoke so well about. So how are we doing this? Well, we have to reach Kenyans. I know that internationally, children all over the world love elephants. What about African children in Africa? How do we get to them? We chose Kenya's first lady, Margaret Kenyatta, to be the voice and a spokesperson for this. She speaks not only to communities, to politicians, to other first ladies, but also to her husband, the most important person in the land. She's a, an incredibly compassionate, lovely, sophisticated woman who uh, is very well educated. And she came straight out with us, feeding the baby elephants, marching on the streets with thousands of school kids, and wearing our armbands. Now, our armbands are actually mourning bands, mourning not just the death of the elephants, but all those rangers who are dying you know, under the bullets from these poachers. We've gone beyond the first lady and that high level of engagement, and we're inviting people from all kinds of other diverse sectors. This is Giuliani, one of Kenya's top hip-hop artists. I don't listen to hip-hop. I don't know if any of you guys listen to hip-hop, but <laughs> he has a following of millions of people. And so I took him to Amboseli to meet the elephants. And when he saw elephants close up, he started screaming. I was like, you, you don't do that. You don't scream when there are elephants around you. It's just not the right thing to do. And I discovered, here's one of Kenya's most successful musicians. He's never been in a national park, and he has this vast following. So the moment he went into the park, he met an elephant called Grandis. Looks like a big elephant. He's not that big. He's 21 years old. You know, anyone who knows elephants knows he's a young bull. For Giuliani, this bull spoke to him. And he wrote a song about Grandis, and it's just been launched with Emmanuel Jal, a South Sudanese artist, Vanessa Mdei, a Tanzanian artist, uh, Sisi Maranga, a Congolese artist. So they've put out a song called Tusimame. Singers, famous singers from Africa, singing about elephants. And the words mean, let's stand for elephants. And they will be performing this song all across the continent. So we held a huge music con a concert this, this year to celebrate that with a bunch of other major Kenyan um, artists. We go into the field, we talk to communities, we march on the streets all over the world, not just in Kenya. We have a supermodel, like a Juma on the right, who's also part of this campaign. And of course, we spend a lot of time in schools. But something we did this year really triggered a, a new idea for me, which was using citizen science. So this year, we launched uh, a very simple idea. Let's invite the public who come to the national parks to help us to count zebras. All you've got to do is take photographs, bring your photographs to us. We'll load them into a computer. The software will tell you how many zebras there are. I didn't realize, we, we're planning this for elephants, but we thought, let's try it with an innocuous species, zebras. It was unbelievable. The amount of public interest in two days, we generated 10,000 photographs of people who just wanted to be part of science. They brought their children. We had a little seven-year-old girl write a poem about zebras because she was so thrilled by this. The poem was only about zebra poo. It was, it was this really amazing, you know, reaction that we got. And so we realized that actually here is an opportunity to enlist people to come to the parks because they're doing something meaningful. They're not just driving around looking at, oh, it's another zebra. Those guys are plainly rats. It's actually getting people involved in doing science and contributing to saving these species. When it comes to the supply of ivory, Kenya is right at the center it's a hub for the transiting of ivory. It's number one in the world. Mombasa Port is number one in the world. And Nairobi Airport is number one in the world. So we are actually targeting, looking at these ports and trying to uh, shut down these links, working with the new prosecution unit of the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, which is a specialized wildlife crime unit, which was created as a result of the work that we're doing. We also have a new law with some of the most severe penalties in the world. If you're caught killing an elephant or trafficking in ivory, or in possession of ivory, the penalty is life imprisonment, or a 20 million shilling fine. That's about $200,000 uh, $200, US. Kenya, like Tanzania and many other countries, has vast ivory stockpiles from all those seizures. 
we've been lobbying to have all of this destroyed. And on the 3rd of March, the president burned 15 tons of ivory. But we're also going out into uh, China and Hong Kong. I visited Ch uh, Hong Kong with Richard Leakey, and we spent a week, we spoke to 11 schools. This was one of the schools. I was, I assumed that children and people in China and Asia know about elephants. I was, I was actually really horrified. These children were literally crying tears when they saw that elephants are dying. Elephants are being killed. It, it actually surprised me and pleased me because we really have to ask not only Africans, but Asians as well, is it worth it? Is it really worth it to have that little carving at the cost of all these animals in Africa? And so our campaign messaging tries to get this uh, message across. And last week, we hosted the very first national debate on the future of elephants, and we pitched it as a big fight because there are different views out there. There are some people who think that ivory should be sold or elephants should be sold or some other crazy ideas. And so we brought together Kenya's top economists and uh, journalists to debate with conservationists about the future of elephants. The debate was very interesting, but, but just because one point came out, one particular participant got very agitated, and he said, I don't get why we're even having this conversation. If you go to China, the panda bear is treasured. There is a red line under the panda bear. Why don't we have a red line for elephants? And that's where this campaign is now going. In order, as I mentioned earlier, Nairobi Airport is one of the major hubs for the transiting of ivory. And it's not huge volumes, it's not major container loads, it's actually just uh, a few bangles, earrings. Can you imagine, you, buy, you come to Africa, you go to Kinshasa, buy a pair of earrings that you think are very beautiful, you get nabbed in Kenya, and you could end up in jail for life. So what we're trying to do is to demonstrate a new kind of um, responsibility towards the visitors who come to Africa through the gateway of Nairobi Airport, through this kind of messaging, in, informing people that the price of ivory is life imprisonment. And we want to work with any of the uh, tra travel and tour companies who are here on co-branding of this messaging so that people don't come to Africa and ignorantly buy these products, which is actually driving the slaughter. We are planning to work with Kenya Airways, which is our national carrier, uh, in part because it's been said several times before, we really do need to bring pride. There is a sense of enormous despondency that it's too late, 30,000 elephants being killed every year, it's, uh, you know, we can't solve this problem. Actually, I think that Africans need to know that we can solve this problem. And we're working with partners to put these kinds of messages onto their vehicles, transporters, containers, aircraft. Um, the last presentation I gave to the tourism industry, Safari Link, one of Kenya's airlines, actually adopted this immediately. And we have their stickers all over their aircraft. Um, and Stefano Celli, through Celli and Peacock, have also taken our stickers and put them on all of their vehicles uh, in all of their camps. And the proposal at Nairobi Airport is to have everything baggage tags, boarding passes, and all kinds of things as well. So, as we uh, approach our campaign in trying to drive messages and actually affect very strategic changes in Kenya, we have to often stop. There's so much happening, but we have to stop and think about it. So what does it really mean? How does it make you feel that elephants could be gone in our lifetimes? I, I think we really need a lot of help from different sectors. This is a multifaceted crisis. It needs new kinds of partnerships and new kinds of solutions. The demand far outstrips the supply, and there is this international criminal element to it. African governments can't do it alone. We need, to, we need the help of partners. And these are some of the suggestions that we have on what can be done. We need help with lobbying African governments, especially on the responsible messaging to tourists who come to this continent. We need co-branding with various people who actually engage with those visitors who come into Africa. And um, the sponsorship from various organizations to help us accelerate the outreach and replicate it across the entire continent so that Africans themselves actually play a major leading role in changing that story, changing that narrative. They are our elephants, and it's our responsibility to protect them for the global audience. Thank you. Thank you.